Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Addressing Housing Affordability During COVID-19, presented by StreetEasy. You're welcome to submit questions at any time today using the questions pane of the control panel. And if your computer speaker system isn't working, try selecting telephone in the audio panel to dial in via phone. And just a note, today's webinar is being recorded. I'd now like to introduce your host, StreetEasy's Manager of Government and Community Affairs, Sarah Kennedy. Thanks so much, Lori, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah, and as Lori mentioned, I'm a member of StreetEasy and Zillow's Government and Community Affairs team. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope that you and yours are safe and comfortable from wherever you're tuning in from. I'm here tuning in from Brooklyn and really excited that today we are convening some of the smartest minds on the topics of housing affordability. This is an issue that we here at StreetEasy have been researching for years. And now it's more important than ever, given the impacts that the pandemic has had on our local communities and renters, particularly in areas that were already the most housing insecure prior to COVID-19. And that's the very topic we dug into on our recently published rent affordability report a flagship piece of research that we publish every year. As a follow-up to that research that we just released last Thursday, we've gathered a great panel of experts to share their on-the-ground perspectives about our most pressing housing affordability issues, the impact that COVID-19 has had on them, and discuss possible solutions and next steps. A recording of this program will be sent to all attendees afterwards via email, and will also be available on the StreetEasy blog. Before we get started, a quick reminder, we'll make sure to leave time for Q&A with all of the speakers at the end of the program. So if you have any questions throughout, you can submit them at any time using the question box on the side on the GoToWebinar control panel. And now I'll hand it over to our economist, Nancy Wu, to introduce herself and walk through a few key points on the latest affordability research, which will help set the stage for our panel conversation. Nancy, take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Wu. I'm the economist at StreetEasy and I lead the research efforts around everything real estate related on the rentals and sales market. Every year StreetEasy spends the entire summer doing a deep dive into rent affordability, which is one of the most pressing issues in New York City that New Yorkers face. And this year we could not ignore COVID as an angle of the research. So I'm really excited to share with you guys some of the research findings that we have from the report. So rent affordability has been an ongoing issue in New York City even before the pandemic. And this year with COVID-19 being in the epicenter in New York City, we looked into the extent to which this public health crisis was related to the rent affordability crisis. And now we know that the impacts of the pandemic has been uneven across New York City. As shown by this map, the New York City Department of Health makes COVID case data available every day. And as of July, we looked at this map um, and look at the different areas in New York City in which COVID-19 cases was impacting the city disparately. So there's more COVID cases, a higher rate of COVID cases in the farther parts of the outer boroughs, in the Bronx and Staten Island, and lower case rates in Manhattan and the western part of Brooklyn and Queens. So we already know from this data that the pandemic has had uneven impacts across the city, across geographies, especially impacting communities of color, immigrant communities, and communities that have lower incomes. And in knowing this, we really wanted to see what is the, of the areas that have the highest rates of COVID cases versus the areas with the lowest COVID cases, how are they impacted separately by rent affordability going into the crisis? So before we get to the findings, I'll go a little bit into our methodology. We looked at two groups of geographies in New York City, the most impacted zip codes by COVID-19 and the least impacted zip codes. Some examples of neighborhoods in the most impacted zip codes are Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, Corona, and some examples in the least impacted areas are Battery Park City, West Village, and Soho and Tribeca. So looking into these two groups of neighborhoods, we then put those into our 3DZ custom rent index. The rent index is a statistical methodology that looks at changes of rents over time 
that is a better way than looking at changes with median rents alone because our rent index allows us to control for housing quality, for the number of bedrooms, and for the composition of the market as well as location. So we're able to see how price changes over time between the most impacted and the least impacted neighborhoods. Now, keeping in mind, this is street easy data, so it is market rate apartments that are in our data. And keeping in mind that there are more apartments in the most impacted areas, especially that are public housing and not market rate data. But we still know that market rate data can show us some changes in the housing market of a neighborhood. Going into the results now, we saw that the most impacted neighborhoods rents grew by 22% between July 2014 and July 2020, which is twice as much as the lower rate zip codes, which rose by 10% in the same period. So prices were growing rapidly in the areas that were most affected by COVID. So these are neighborhoods that have been most rent burdened and facing the hardest affordability crisis over time. There's a lot of factors at play here. We know that with lower rents, naturally, lower median rents will grow at a faster rate than higher rents, but it's more than just a numbers game because there's a lot of factors here, including housing supply. There's been limited housing supply that is affordable in New York City. The past six years, we've seen rapid population growth as record numbers of people move to the city for employment, and that strong urge and desire for more affordable apartments has further pushed up rents in the outer boroughs and the areas that would be most impacted by COVID-19 this year. Now, since COVID-19 has hit the city, we're seeing that the pandemic has further exacerbated the differences in rent growth between the highest rate of COVID neighborhoods and the lowest rate of COVID neighborhoods. So between February and July, 2020, Rents in high COVID-19 zip codes stayed relatively flat at 0.3%, while they fell in the low rate zips by 1.9%. Now, since August and September, the low rate zips in Manhattan, the prices have fallen by even more, in some neighborhoods falling as much as 10% to other areas at least 4%. So Manhattan has seen a lot of rent falling. And you know the narrative that we hear in the news a lot now is that rents are falling in New York City and there's this urban exodus of people moving out of Manhattan for the suburbs or for California. And it's really just revealed that there's a tale of two cities in New York where there are people moving, there are high vacancy rates in Manhattan and some of the areas that are the least impacted by COVID where we're seeing rent drops, but it's not the case in the areas that are most burdened by the coronavirus pandemic and also by rent affordability. So rents have not, renters in the most impacted COVID neighborhoods have not faced rent relief since the pandemic has hit the city. And if anything, unemployment and the disparate impacts of COVID-19 have only made it harder to pay rent. So there's a lot of disparate incomes here and we want to get into this conversation to see this narrative and we'll get the conversation started. Now you can find the full report of the affordability report on our blog and let's get into the conversation. I'm excited to start this discussion. Great, thank you so much, Nancy. So we all just got a glimpse into that research. I know it was a lot of data, uh, but I think that's really gonna help set the stage for this conversation where we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into what this looks like on the ground and where the biggest problems with affordability lie. And then at the end, uh, before getting to all of your great questions in our Q&A session, we'll also ask our participants about some solutions. And with that, I'd like to welcome the rest of our panel, Charlie McNally, Director of Eternal External Affairs at the Furman Center, and Barika Williams, Executive Director at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development ANHD. Thank you both so much for being here. We'll start with Charlie. Charlie, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at the center? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to participate in this conversation. Uh, Sarah, to you and the Street Easy team, to my co-panelists, Nancy uh, and uh, Barika. Uh, so the, I'll just briefly introduce the Furman Center. Uh, the NYU Furman Center is a joint research institute of the NYU School of Law. Uh, and the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Uh, 
Uh, and for the last 25 years, we've worked to advance research and debate on housing, neighborhoods, uh, and urban policy. We're a multidisciplinary uh, institute, so our faculty and senior staff uh, have backgrounds in economics, in law, in community development, a lot of practitioner exper uh, experience there. And as the Director of External Affairs, I get to participate in interesting discussions like this one and try to get our research out there uh, you know, to make sure that uh, the discussion around subsidized housing and urban policy in New York has an empirical foundation. So I'm really happy to join today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Glad to have you here today. And next, I'd like to welcome Barika Williams. Barika, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do with the team at ANHD? Sure. Um, first off, thank you, Sarah and Nancy and, and Charlie as well, and to the Street Easy team for having me here for today's panel. Uh, so my name is Barika Williams. I'm the Executive Director at ANHD, the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Um, we're a nonprofit organization here in New York City that's uh, over 45 years old. Um, we were created by actually some of the original housing CDCs and tenants' rights groups back in New York City. The seven early ones realized that they were working in their neighborhoods and needed something to work across them. So we think of ourselves as sort of the convener and connector and back office across more than 80 plus non for profit organizations that work on the neighborhood level. Um, and we work on affordable housing, equitable economic development, land use, and responsible banking and investment in communities through com capacity building, technical assistance, policy, and advocacy. Terrific. Thanks so much, Barika. We're excited to have you all here. And to start, I really want to just get your thoughts. Would like for Charlie and Barika to weigh in on your reactions to the research. Um, Charlie, we'll start with you. You know, reactions to, to what you've heard in Nancy's presentation, is this similar to what you've been seeing at the Furman Center? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it became clear uh, very early on in our analysis of uh, the impact of COVID-19 that both the health and the economic uh, you know, effects were disproportionately uh, hitting uh, historically uh, disinvested neighborhoods, neighborhoods with higher uh, Black and Hispanic populations, and, uh, you know, that this was compounding existing inequities. Uh, you know, the other thing I'll say is that sadly, this is not the first time we've seen this pattern. We did some research in the wake of the foreclosure crisis that showed that, you know, subprime lending was concentrated in, in these same neighborhoods. So, um, it's it's really upsetting that it doesn't seem like whether the crisis is human uh, engineered or you know a more natural phenomenon like a pan pandemic, uh, you know the, the compounding impact is uh, the same, and I think we really need to consider that in our policy response. Great, thanks, Charlie. Uh, Barika, what about you? Is this is this something that you've seen in your work at ANHD? Was there anything surprising about the research? Um, no, actually, it was it was very similar, uh, as Charlie was saying, to what we were seeing in our research and, and data analysis at ANHD. Um, early on in COVID, we put out uh, some data analysis and mapping around combining and looking at uh, communities of color, specifically black and brown communities, uh, communities that are rent burdened, uh, communities where there's a concentration of essential workers, and those neighborhoods that are most heavily impacted by COVID. And you see, as, as similar to what Charlie and what Nancy has found, that those things layer on top and that we're seeing those factors really being concentrated in some core neighborhoods across New York City. Um, a, another piece to add in is, unfortunately, we also know that those are the neighborhoods that are struggling to have access to many of the resources, resources and support. So whether that's federal aid, whether that's PPP loans, whether that's local loans um, or grants, it's also many of the communities that we know are often disconnected from the supports, even though they're the neighborhoods and areas that are most impacted and most need those resources. Thanks, Barika. And we'll speak a little bit to some of those federal resources uh, at the end when we talk about potential solutions. And as Nancy, as Nancy mentioned earlier, you know, when we looked at this research, we really focused on market rate rents um, and, and how those have been impacted. But would love to hear from you both. You know, what do you think um, will, will happen in terms of market rate rents potentially impacting rent stabilized units or even public housing units across the city? Tariki, you want to start with this one? I have some thoughts, but feel free to, to, to kick it off. Um, I, um, 
So, you, you know, I think it's a really interesting question. I think uh, it, it gets at the degree to uh, which different segments of New York City's rental market are connected, right? Um, you know, you, you can think of the market in terms of the higher end segment, the luxury housing, you know, sort of mid-range housing, and then, you know, lower rent housing that's more typically occupied by low-income fam families. And there's some overlapping in those segments with rent stabilization. Uh, public housing is, is, is more exclusively towards the lower end of the, you know, uh, of those three segments. But rent stabilization, I would say, spans, the, you know, the middle and, and and lower segments of the market. Um, and we, we've done some research on how connected these segments are. Uh, one of our recent doctoral fellows did a study that shows uh, you know, that new market rate construction in a neighborhood actually lowers nearby rent, um, particularly in the upper and middle segments of the market. So you know, we know from this re research on new supply um, that these segments are connected um, there's some research out of the Upjohn Institute that makes, you know, that has similar findings. However, there are limits to how connected they are, right? And the same study that found, uh, you know, rent relief uh, from adding supply in the higher and middle segments of the market uh, also found that in the lower segments of the market, uh, you know, rent stayed steady despite the addition of new apartments. Uh, so that's consistent, I think, very much with this, uh, you know, some of this research you're publishing today. and. Uh, it uh, you, know, you know it speaks to the limits of of, of how connected these uh, markets are and and how much these vacancies and these rent declines uh, you know how far they'll sort of ripple out throughout the entire rental stock um, you know it, it's one store one potential story is that you know uh, rent regulation sort of forms a, a wall between these uh, market segments um, but uh, you know I think it's an area a really interesting area and one that deserves further research and analysis yeah and I, I think um, uh, one of the things that Charlie is highlighting is that there are that we sort of talk about the housing market as if it's one big continuous uh, element but there are really big differences and distinctions between what happens at the top end of New York City's housing market and what happens at the lower, more affordable end, right? So when you think about the span just in terms of rental costs, you've got neighborhoods where the average rents are around 1,000 or 1,200, sometimes even below that. Um, and then you've got other neighborhoods where their average rent is you know, pushing up in the upper twos, sometimes borderline threes. So it's a really big range in terms of what we're talking about. And then we put this under a big umbrella of New York City's housing and rental market. And that's sort of hard to talk about um, under one sort of to total large tent. Um, another thing that we've really been focusing on in the midst of COVID and, and obviously is a pressing conversation right now is how this is playing out live in real time in terms of the decisions people are making um, and vacancy rate and mobility. So what we're really seeing is that top end of the market that ta Charlie was talking about is where we're seeing most of the mobility, um, most of potentially the flight leaving New York City um, and the increase in vacancy rates, right? So there's been, and this is one of the reasons I really appreciated Street Easy's research and, and what Nancy has illustrated is what is happening at the top part of the market is not indicative in what is happening in the rest of New York, right? Um, and what we are hearing reports of and what we're seeing is that in the rest of New York, what landlords are more so doing is saying, I would have taken a 1% or 3% increase, but the market's a little tighter. I'm gonna go ahead and hold the rent steady. Somebody else comes and leases up an affordable unit because it's an affordable unit and there's not a lot of options in that part of the market. That is very different and distinct from the top end of the market where there's constantly new construction coming online. There's constantly a lot of units available and there's sort of a always building more. Uh, there's a little bit of a, if we build it, they will come uh, built into that part of the market. And now I think we all expect to see a lot of vacancy and a lot of availability and a lot of, you know, questions around what happens uh, and can, will those units be able to be leased up? which is gonna be very different than what's happening at the bottom of the market when people are becoming, are unemployed, are continuing to be, continuing to have loss of employment and need actually more affordable units. Um, and that bottom of the market is already incredibly, incredibly tight. And highlighting the bottom of the market more and our data. I know as an economist, I really like having complete data and data that is fully representative of a neighborhood. However, it's difficult to get data in neighborhoods where 
there's more public housing and less market rate apartments listed online, areas that are lower income that don't have access to internet, that don't use street easy, immigrant communities where English isn't their first language and it's easier to get apartments across through word of mouth, like in Chinatown, the flyers on the on the wall that I used to live in were all in Mandarin and not on street easy. And there's a lot of informal networks out there to find apartments. However, that doesn't mean that we should exclude these neighborhoods that don't have the perfect data available to us from our analysis. Because when we only look at the places with a lot of data represented on Street Easy or on real estate on online marketplaces, we see a picture of Manhattan, we see downtown Brooklyn, these luxury neighborhoods. But the areas where there's a lot of affordability issues and areas where the pandemic has been impacting the most, seeing any data and making an analysis based on that rather than is better than not talking about it at all because we need to use whatever data we can to show a complete picture of the different stories across geographies of New York City. It's a good opportunity. Yeah, exactly right. Go ahead, Charlie. I was just going to say that's a good opportunity to plug the census, which ends in in two weeks and is so so important for getting that complete uh, data that we all rely on in our research. Great, great point. Get, get out there and, and fill out your census. Um, if, you're, if you're anything like my building, they're, they're coming and knocking on your door uh, all day, every day if you've not filled it out yet. So, so please do that. Um, and one thing that you all really have touched on a little bit so far is the fact that affordability struggles are really a result of, of a compounding issues. And these aren't just happening really in a vacuum, right? There's higher eviction filing rates. There's falling vacancy rates for the past few years. And at this point, we're really seeing the highest rates of unemployment that New York City has seen in quite some time, coupled with overcrowding, things like that, that are really, you know, in, indicative of a highly competitive and a really supply strained rental market. Um, so we'd love to, you know, talk a little bit about these compounding issues. Um, Brika, I will pass it to you. Would love your perspective on really the current picture here, how all of these things are, are compounding and, and working together to impact housing secure renters across New York City. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, actually been a very, very, I mean, for many reasons, but a very stressful few months. Um, and really we're in a place in the state right now where especially low income renters and vulnerable renters of any kind are sort of on this rolling 30 day month to month instability and questions right every month it's a question of can i make my rent will evictions be allowed in new york city or new york state what does that mean for me will my landlord move forward on actions and you know the the big question and threat and this isn't unique to new york city this isn't unique to new york state this is really a national question is then what happens when we get to the end of this right because people have not been able to pay months of rent if you take even the low example of rent and you say somebody had thousand dollars and they were out of a job or underemployed for a few months and now they have three thousand dollars worth of rent to catch up on uh, the reality is we know from data that has come from uh, the fed reserve that most people can't tap into more than about seven hundred dollars worth of unexpected expenses without going to credit cards and these are the communities that really don't have $3,000 worth of, of a credit limit to tap into for, for their, for their and, and access for debt. So I think we're really at this question of, and, and we've been hearing this refrain and using it here in New York City, an eviction tsunami that is that we're on sort of constantly waiting for and, and, and terrified of um, in a city that already has a homelessness crisis and the potential of a second, uh, Charlie mentioned it, foreclosure crisis that is mainly gonna hit our low income uh, homeowners, our seniors and our first time home buyers, right? Um, and so it's, it, I think the, the, the broader question is, are we going to sort of allow this crisis to wipe out and create multi-generational debt um, for communities that were already incredibly unstable to begin with um, and now are just sort of you know, trying to, and I say trying to because many people can't hang in there week to week, month to month, and try to figure out what comes next. Really, really well put. Um, and Charlie, I know the team at the Furman Center has done a lot of research on these issues as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, just to piggyback off of what, what Barika said, you know, we did a deep dive into uh, eviction filing trends, um, you know, through 2019. So before the pandemic hit, and it was uh, dramatic and striking that the neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID uh, were the neighborhoods that had the highest rates of uh, eviction filings, you know, before this crisis, uh, you know, uh, ever appeared. So, uh, you know, it really does um, magnify uh, and, and, and compound uh, the inequities that we've been talking about. Uh, uh, another point I'll make, uh, you know, related to this concern about the ripple effects through the system and, and the, the debt and foreclosure that Barika mentioned is, you know, how does that affect the um, the ownership entities of rental housing, you know, in, in the wake of the 2008 crisis, you saw a lot of institutional investors buy up a, a large stock of smaller building single family homes and convert them uh, to, to rental stock. Um, and, uh, you know, that was caused by foreclosure, you know, those opportunities were created by foreclosures and smaller landlords, either selling or, you know, becoming financially distressed. Um, I think there's a real uh, risk of, uh, you know, a similar kind of uh, trend um, without a strong federal response, which, which I'll, maybe I'll make my pitch for later. Great, thank you. And yes, we want we want that pitch uh, later for sure. Um, and we really we can't talk about these affordable affordability issues without talking about racial inequities. And you know the well-reported fact that low-income people of color across New York City and across the country have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, also by rapid rent growth and by gentrification. And to put a number to it, recent Census Bureau data, again, the census, uh, reveals that more than one fifth of black and Hispanic adults said that their households either missed rent in June or missed their mortgage payment then, or paid as late as the end of July. And these numbers are more than twice that of white adults. Brika, I'll start with you. Um, what are you and the team at ANHD seeing in terms of how these issues are impacting Black and Latinx renters that you work with on the ground? Um, I mean, I, I think this ties back a little bit to what we were just talking about. I mean, it's it's a it's it's quite frankly a it's a terrifying prospect for me individually, but also for us societally. Um, uh, we have so much further to go in terms of trying to move the needle on racial justice in housing and in economic justice. Um, but where we're sort of at right now is a question of, you know, the next steps, what we do in terms of resources and supports to get out of this are going to determine whether or not we erase somewhere between the last 20 plus, you know, scary to say 50 years worth of, of um, advances in uh, trying to ensure racial equity in housing and in jobs and in the economy, right? It, it's so uh, ANHD just put out a, a report uh, that highlighted in New York City's um, uh, home mortgages. It's about uh, a total of somewhere between nine and eighteen percent, because keeping going back to, of course, then the census, race and ethnicity are two different categories. So it's oftentimes hard to fold them together um, as so it's between nine and 18 percent of of home loans are going to black and latinx um uh, uh home uh first time or home buyers period right that's a huge that's that is disproportionate to the number of people of color in new york city right off the bat right so we're uh almost 50 years out more than 50 years out from the fair housing act and we're still maybe optimistically getting to 20 percent home ownership loans to people of color Right. And so now we're on the precipice of realizing that many of those folks are the folks who are disproportionately turned away for assistance or disproportionately turned away for loans are going to be disproportionately denied the ability to refinance. Um, oftentimes don't have access to the same legal services and resources um, to move them through the system to fight um, foreclosures and evictions. Uh, and I do want to highlight here that that in this moment in time, as, as terrifying as this is, New York City is actually in a little bit of a better place than some other places because we have right to counsel, which is at least providing some level of protections for our 20 hardest hit zip, co zip codes for evictions, which are mainly Black and Latinx uh, residents. 
right? But can we imagine where we would be if we were just allowing the pipeline of evictions to move forward without allowing any kind of resources for Black and Latinx and people of color, um, the supports and resources that they need, right? Nancy was uh, talking about uh, the number of people who navigate our our rental and our home ownership uh, system who where English isn't their first language or where they don't speak English in their household at all. And we don't really have a way and resources to support them. And we're gonna ask them to not just get, to not just manage through their normal, um, complicated and, and unfair and inequitable system, but now we're gonna ask them to do that in the midst of a crisis where almost nothing is clear. Really, really well put. Um, and our colleagues at Zillow have actually done some research around these topics. Uh, Nancy, could you share a little bit more about that research? Yeah, Zillow has done quite a bit of research in the past few months around inequities due to COVID and the systemic inequalities that have been pervading the country and New York City for quite some time now. Um, so one finding was that the layoffs from coronavirus and unemployment has disproportionately impacted Latinx, Asian, and Black workers because they are overrepresented in the food, the arts, and service industries that have been affected by mass layoffs and furloughs. Non-white households in these industries were already more cost burdened and rent burdened to begin with than white households even before any wages were lost, meaning that they were more vulnerable to experiencing housing insecurity even before COVID hit the city and after, especially after missing pay from unemployment and layoffs. In addition, there's been, when seeking for loans and mortgages, LGBTQ plus buyers as well as black buyers have been more likely to be denied a mortgage or loans across the country, not just in New York City. And there's all of these um, factors that have been systemically ingrained in the US as well as in New York City that further exacerbate these inequalities and these issues along across racial lines, across income lines, across ethnicities and immigrant populations. So it's really important to look into this more. Great, thank you, Nancy. And I know one topic that has that has come up in just about the answer to every question um, is really, is this evictions moratorium, right? So in New York State, the evictions moratorium has been continued to be extended uh, over the last several months. The CDC also announced last week a new nationwide evictions moratorium. Um, I know a lot of people see this as great. This is this is a quick fix. We need to make sure that we're able to keep people in their homes, uh, but want to open it up to the group. I mean, what's what's going to happen at the end of this eviction moratorium? Um, as as Barika noted, are, are people just going to have you know six or seven months of rent that they're able to pay at the end? Um, you know what. What, what do we think is going to happen here in New York City? Well, I, I guess I would say first and foremost, especially around the CDC moratorium that just recently happened, the first thing that really needs to, to unfold is a massive New York City, New York State, and nationwide um, uh, sort of PSA and advertising to let people know about it. Uh, one thing about this is that you have to be you have to qualify. There are certain specifications that are required for the individual or household to qualify. And then you also have to sign and submit a letter affirming that you are eligible and then turn it over to your landlord. Um, I know there were some reports, uh, a reporter did it down their own individual research in Houston, where they visited something like a hundred different uh, sort of um, eviction hearings and cases. And they said only in what only one instant did instance did the renter know that this was something available to them and in almost no instances were judges raising it right so i think that there's this big question of even before we get to december which is terrifying enough um what happens and how are we making sure that we're protecting as many people as possible before then um and then once we get to whether it's you know now or December, we there there is no possibility, there is no scenario where all of these renters have the resources to pay their back rent. Um, I think that is something that is uniformly shared and agreed upon by everybody who knows renters analysis, housing data, <laughs> the housing market. It's it's just not it, it's just not a reality. Um, and so there has to be some injection of 
relief and resources in order for there to be a solution at the end of this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, I think um, you, you hit the nail on the head with regard to the outreach and, and public education that's necessary around this patchwork of protections that has evolved over the last six months, right? I mean, just, just here in New York State, you have all three branches of government weighing in on this, right? You have the legislature passing the Safe Harbor Act. You have, uh, you know, various levels of the court system, uh, the civil court, the housing court, you know, uh, releasing updated guidance on a regular basis. You have executive orders uh, and the Pause Act, e even just in New York. And then you have layered on top of that this this CDC action. So, you know, career uh, legal housing professionals uh, have trouble sorting through uh, the, the thicket of what's going on here. Uh, so you can imagine imagine for uh, tenants, you know, uh, maybe non-native English speaking tenants, for landlords, smaller landlords without capacity, this is an incredibly uh, confusing thing to navigate. So, you know, trying to be uh, throughout, throughout this as clear as possible about exactly who is protected and how, um, I think is, is one key um, part of getting it right. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of, of what happens in December, I, you know, I think to answer that, you first have to know what happens in November, and I'm I'm not really sure I'm prepared to speculate about about that. Um, but you know, I think that's a key piece of the puzzle as well. Yeah, and and what everyone hit on, right? This this is super complicated. This is not easy. Um, none none of us on this call, even though you know th these are issues that we talk about and think about and do work on day in and day out, have a, a silver bullet. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about. There needs to be more education. Renters, tenants in New York City, all across the country need to know what their rights are and there needs to be clarity around what exactly is happening. Um, I'd love to hear more about you know, other solutions. Is it, is it rental assistance and subsidies, you know, additional in incentives around affordable housing development here in the city, you know, whether short-term or long-term? Um, what do you think that New York City should be doing right now, uh, whether it's the city itself, uh, individuals here on this call, or you know, or even companies. Um, we're, we're all New Yorkers, and and how can we help really preserve, develop, and and invest in our communities? So, so that's a that's a great question. But bef before I answer that, here is where I'll give my pitch for for a strong federal response, right? You know. Um, Barika mentioned this, and I think it's absolutely right. We did an analysis of, of New York State and New York City of the rental assistance need. Um, and just to get people back to their pre-pandemic level of housing cost burdens, which was a situation where over half of renters were paying 30% or more of their income toward rent. So not an ideal situation, but just, just to get back there in New York City, uh, assuming a 25% recovery in employment, we estimate would take six hundred million dollars a month, right? That that is just uh, in in rental assistance, and and there's just no other entity outside the federal government that has the resources to provide, uh, you know, assistance on that level. Um, so you know, I think you know the the city and the state have taken some important first steps. I think there's more that they can do, but um, you know, without without a strong federal response, I, I really don't think you can address this problem at the necessary scale. I think that's an important precursor to this, this part of the conversation. Um, and I, I would echo what, what Charlie just said. And I, I think this, what can everybody be doing in this moment in time is this is one of the moments in time, spaces and places where I think, and I would hope that we could have some consistency and shared accountability and responsibility across New Yorkers, corporations, individuals, housers, landlords, recognizing that this is absolutely critical and vital, right? If, if I understand that this might not be the direct impact or the direct reality, especially for some of our wealthier communities, especially for some of the more privileged and predominantly white communities in New York City, but if we think that New York is gonna rebound and recover, and to Charlie's point, back to what it was, which actually is not what we're advocating for. We're advocating for building and going beyond and recovering further and stronger than what we were. Um, then that is going to require that resources go to the most impacted areas. 
we have to do recovery differently. We can't just ensure that recovery serves the top end of the market, of the top end of renters, of homeowners, and think that everybody else is going to find a way through. It's, it's, just, not, it's just not sustainable, it's not real, it's not gonna work. Um, and I think it's an enormous amount of, of burden. It only further amplifies the racial inequity that's been in our housing system, in our housing market for decades. Um, and I think it raises this broader question of like, what does that New York look like, right? What does that New York City look like when we've learned, leaned on and turned to essential workers to carry us through this for six months, nine months, a year, a year and a half, dot, 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 question mark, right? Um, and then at the end of it, step away from them and say, you can handle your recovery on your own, right? I just, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's, it will not work for our economy, and it also doesn't work for us as a, as a, as a responsible society that treats all of our residents that, that in a way that they should be, that where we respect and acknowledge the dignity of their work and the dignity of their contribution to the city. Thank you, Barika. And, and entirely agree. This is this is a big problem, and we can't solve it today. But I'm glad that that the conversation is happening. Um, and I wanted to pause here and you know, let everyone know that at this point, we'll move into the audience Q&A. So if you have a question and you haven't asked it yet, please put that in the question box. Um, and once we start getting them, oh, we already got a few coming through. Uh, I will ask them and we will get to as many as we can. So here's the first one. Um, what aren't we talking about? And should we be talking about more when it comes to New York City's affordable housing crisis? So I'll tackle one piece of that, um, which is one piece that we aren't talking about or that people tend to like to avoid talking about, I should say, um, is the majority as of right market rate development part of our housing market. Um, I think we've been in this sort of consistent and long-standing cycle um, uh, where we rely on affordable housing developers, uh, preservation in certain units, and NYCHA uh, to address our affordability crisis uh, and sort of, uh, uh, to, to Charlie and I's earlier points, um, put that in a subset, uh, and that's in theory where we're supposed to handle most of New York City's housing affordability, but actually uh, it's half of New York City households make less than about $74,000. Um, so unless half of New York City's housing market can fit into those elements, which it can't, uh, then we're constantly going to stay in this crisis of housing affordability. We have to find a way to really address the fact that our cross the board housing market um, has to think about affordability and fold in affordability as a priority and necessity. It can't be subjugated to a small subset. I, I think that's a great point. Um, I, I, I will broaden out a, a little bit in my response of, uh, about what we're not talking about. I think um, exclusionary zoning in, in the suburbs, uh, you know, when you look at a, a, a metro area, uh, when you look at the housing market as a metro-wide uh, market, I think is a conversation that we we haven't had enough of here in New York. Uh, you know, in in states like Oregon and California, uh, they have paired uh, stronger tenant protections, uh, things that might be equivalent to just cause eviction here. Um, you know, with policies to remove um, the ban on building. Uh, different kinds of housing in areas that are zoned for exclusively single family homes. Um, our neighbors in New Jersey and Massachusetts have, uh, you know, strategies to accomplish, uh, you know, the, those same goals to, to build different kinds of housing in different kinds of communities. Uh, we just haven't had that conversation in New York to date. Um, and I think it's a really important part of both the housing affordability picture and uh, a part of unwinding, you know, the legacy of segregation and racial exclusion um, in a lot of communities uh, in New York and it's New York City and its surrounding communities. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, at this time when we're thinking about what kinds of kinds of conversations uh, we haven't had and, uh, you know, how to build back better and in a more fair way, we can think about, you know, these exclu exclusionary zoning policies and how to change them. <laughs> 
Great, thank you, Charlie. I know that zoning has been a big um, question and topic of conversation recently, you know, both in East New York as well as in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Um, another question that came through here around vacancy rates. Um, so I know we discussed a little bit about how the vacancy rate has been on the rise and would love for you all to speak to how this might impact affordable and, and rent stabilized housing stock for New Yorkers. Uh, Charlie, I guess I'll take this one first. So sure. I think generally we we uh, there's sort of pretty shared um, sentiment and and feeling that uh, the vacancy rate is not at risk of tipping over to the point um, where we would potentially have to look at whether it impacts our rent stabilization laws. Uh, a the HVS the housing vacancy survey is due to happen later this year and delayed. That's in part because this year it would have coincided with the census. Um, our housing, New York City's housing vacancy survey is actually done uh, in collaboration with the census office. Um, so obviously they needed to, to separate those two, but also, I mean, I think this ties back to uh, some of Nancy's research and some of what we've been talking about is uh, most of those reports of high vacancy rates are coming from our luxury housing, our higher income neighborhoods, not seeing the same level of vacancy rates and the same spikes in vacancy rates across the rest of the city's housing market. Uh, and I think the general sen sentiment is that it would take um, a substantive change from where we are right now in order to, to tip it over. And I know Charlie has some thoughts on sort of legislatively as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it's interesting. And Varika, I'll just uh, not necessarily push back, but, you know, just entertain a thought experiment. Maybe this is a little bit provocative. But, you know, when you think about the history of rent growth and gentrification uh, throughout New York, it's, uh, you know, I, th I think a common narrative or story is people getting priced out of central areas like Manhattan, right? And then they go to like a Williamsburg or a Greenpoint or a Long Island City. And then, you know, the, the gentrification and rent growth sort of proceeds outward from that central neighborhood across transit lines. So, you, you know, with vacancy and rent drops in Manhattan, might you over time start to see a reversal of those trends you know people coming back into center city areas and then leaving vacancies in in the neighborhoods where they left and you know potentially uh you know some uh some rent drops there um you know, again, it gets back to this foundational question of how connected are these various segments of the market, uh, and and at what level does the connection end? You know, uh, at what income level, at what rent level, uh, are, are they disconnected from the rest of the market? So, you know, the, I, I think that's something we're going to be studying over the next, uh, you know, a uh, couple of years uh, as as this situation unfolds. I'm not necessarily predicting that outcome, but uh, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's a possible outcome, uh, and I think it, it it certainly bears watching. I, I think another piece that the that Charlie's raising um, in terms of yes, we have we have seen and we have gotten reports of that there are. Um, I don't know what I don't know if I want to say substantial, but there are some significant reports of price drops in both in terms of rents and and uh, condos and co-ops in Manhattan um, compared to maybe sort of small discounts in the outer borough neighborhoods. Um, I think one question about sort of this idea of seeing more inflow back into Manhattan and back into uh, wealthier communities is ties back into a broader question around fair housing because those are many of the areas that have been allowed to, ha to move forward to rampant housing discrimination, not necessarily allow um, uh, especially black and brown uh, uh, homeowners, uh, folks who feel like they are um, excluded from a co-op or condo purchase, but feel like they are eligible and qualify financially. Uh, I know there's been, uh, we ANHG tend to not focus on this as much because it's the higher end of the market, but it is tied to the broader issues of fair housing and, and racial inequity in our housing market is people who are consistently and regularly denied um, from uh, condo associations or co-op um, uh, boards without really any clear justification or rationale as to why and feeling like that is racially tied and that being shared among many different um, uh, potential home buyers. Uh, so I think that potential back 
uh, flow into, into Manhattan's market and into some of these sort of wealthier markets is really going to depend on whether we are demanding uh, that those markets allow everybody access to their units. And adding some, that's a really good point, um, adding some economic context into the flow back into the city. Right now we're seeing that vacancy rates, so rental inventory in Manhattan as of September is one hundred over 100% higher than it was last year. So we're seeing double the amount of properties on the market right now as people's leases were expiring over the summer and rentals were moving out of the city. Again, when I say this, I'm mainly talking about the Manhattan area, the downtown Brooklyn and like Western outer borough areas where people have the wealth to move across the country to their temporary location places for COVID. Um, but unless we see that same level of people flowing back to New York City, rents are going to be falling in the Manhattan area for quite some time and more leases are going to expire, but we're not going to see double the population come back all at once. It's going to be a slow process and this is another another issue that's going to be talked about a lot in the news, but keeping in mind that this is mainly in the Manhattan and the more expensive areas. That's Thank you. That's important to, to keep in mind. And shifting gears, another question that came in. Uh, so, so far, New York City's homeless census has decreased during COVID-19 due to declining applications to shelter. Do you think there will be a surge in applications in the future? Do you think more families will end up moving in together, doubling up? Will they move out of the city or something else? So, so this is um, purely anecdotal. So I have, I just want to say up front, I have, uh, we, I don't have, and and we do, haven't done the data to to um, sort of dive into this or or look into this further. Um, but have heard reports that people seem to be more inclined in the middle of a health pandemic to double and triple up potentially, especially with family and friends, than they are to go into a shelter system where they're with strangers and have less control over the environment. Um, uh, I think that it, in both scenarios, you're crowding people together in, in small spaces. Um, and one of the uh, bits of research that ANHD has done, and I know many of our other housing partners, Jessica Katz team um, has done as well, is really combating and pushing incredibly hard <laughs> back against this narrative that density is facilitating uh, the COVID crisis, um, and I actually uh, was on a, a panel with a colleague of mine um, down in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where they were seeing the same thing, right? This narrative that density is allowing COVID to spread, but what we're actually seeing is that the densest areas of the city are the whitest areas, the wealthiest areas, the areas that have highest access to healthcare. Those are also the areas that have the lowest COVID rates in New York City. And it's actually our neighborhoods that are overcrowded where people are dibbling, tripling up and trying to figure out how to live in very small crowded spaces where we're seeing higher rates of COVID. So it's actually not tied to density. And I think um, one of the questions when it comes to, to sort of hope, what hopefully won't be a homelessness um, uh, explosion is whether or not people are gonna feel confident or, or safe and, and going into the, the shelter system. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I think this this gets back to the adequacy, you know, what, whether homelessness spikes uh, as moratoria expire, it gets back to this question of whether the federal response is sufficient. Uh, also, you know, what we do locally, um, you know, at the Furman Center, we're thinking about adaptive reuse of properties, uh, spaces like hotels that were used, at least in the initial phases of the pandemic, uh, you know, to temporarily house uh, homeless individuals and families, um, you know, whether uh, spaces like hotels and other uh, potentially underused commercial spaces can be sort of adapted and, and converted, um, uh, you know, uh, to housing uses to, to, you know, to provide more long term housing solutions for folks, I think is is a really interesting uh, policy avenue um, for, for addressing uh, this. It'll require regulatory flexibility on the public side, some, you know, innovation and risk taking on the private side. I, I think it's something that uh, that has some potential. Great. Um, and we also have a question here, which may actually be for the city of New York and not for you all, but but I'm going to put it out there in case you have any insights. Um, so talking about 
New York City's program for renters who were unable to pay rent because they were impacted by COVID and unable to pay. Um, do you all have any insights on how this program is working, uh, when payments may be received by those who have qualified and, and what the status looks like there? Um, so I, I know a little bit about it, but actually haven't gotten the most recent update. I mean, the, the key thing and the challenge for this program, I know um, uh, New York City wanted to stand up some sort of program in order to try to get some relief, especially to its its neediest um, uh, residents. It is extremely limited in its size. Uh, and so I think there's a there's going to be some question around know how within the um, program they ensure that the folks who are supposed to be sort of let's call it tier one um, uh, are have access to the resources first and upfront and foremost um, and then move out from there if there's additional funds available um, I think we can try to encourage um, our partners at HPD to, to get the word out and get some updates out and uh, I'll try to have somebody at our a &HD team look at it and, and try to get something on our social media as well to maybe give folks a little bit more insight into that. Great, thanks Marika. Um, and I know we only have a few minutes left, but we'll, we'll get to one last question here. Um, I know we talked a little bit about zoning earlier, but could you all give some insights in how you believe the city could help zone neighborhoods more equitably? I'll let you go first, Breka. Well, um, <laughs> well, I would say first and foremost, up front and uh, in in big flashing uh, lights, is that the city and the zoning process and the land use process has to include an account for race. Um, I think it's uh, um, abhorrent that we basically are blind to the racial reality that neighborhoods are racialized, development is racialized, um, the zoning process has huge inequities built into it, um, and then create this process and sort of uh, um, step back and wanna pretend that some what is gonna transpire and unfold is something that is fair and equitable and accessible across communities, it's not. Uh, so I think first and foremost is that. Uh, ANHD has a coalition that's called the Thriving Communities Coalition, that really works across various different land use partners um, and have called for what we call comprehensive planning um, and a process that really brings together these different elements, understands and can balance uh, local needs and citywide needs, but also recognizes the innate power inequities that are a part of that process. Like right now, what we have is that our local neighborhoods who are disenfranchised get rezonings sort of shoved through and the neighborhoods who do not want something get to say no and it stops and that is not it's not a fair system and it's not a, an appropriate system for any government who's who is trying to move forward and wants to move forward um, a socially just system should be continuing Yeah, I, I don't have uh, much to add in that regard. You know, I'll just uh, say that given uh, the, the scale of the housing shortage in New York, um, you know, I think the Department of City Planning uh, put out a report that, uh, you know, the metro area, we've only added half a unit of housing per new job over the last decade. Uh, and so um, I, I, you know, I think we need to allow for more housing in all different types of communities. And I include not just the five boroughs, but, uh, you know, across the metro area as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, allowing historic preservation and or, um, you know, neighborhoods that have traditionally been lower density to remain that way sort of lets them off the hook uh, from doing their fair share in, in creating the kind of housing opportunity we need and the kind of affordable housing uh, we need. So uh, I won't go any farther since we're an academic institution and not an advocacy group, uh, but I, I think there's a lot to be done that can help affordable housing uh, through uh, through better and smarter zoning. Great. Thank you so much, Charlie, Barika, and Nancy. Um, I don't know about you all, but I would love to just sit here and, and chat housing affordability with them for forever. But 
we are out of time and I know we've really only scratched the surface on so many of these issues. Um, I encourage all of you tuning in to check out the new rent affordability report that we discussed. Um, the URL should be up on your screen now and you'll receive a follow-up email, which includes this too. Um, please do keep an invite out for, or sorry, keep an invite, keep an eye out for, for future invites uh, for our next virtual events. We really look forward to having you with us. And again, a huge thank you to Nancy, Charlie, Barika, and for all of you who joined us today. Thank you so much. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you next time. Thanks.